Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody awake, alive? All right. All right. Good deal. Good deal. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, whenever I, usually by the time I get out here, <clears throat> uh, in the, especially in these first weeks of orientation, I am usually back in my office, and there's a door, obviously, that goes through there. And usually whenever uh, Anthony or Todd or anybody else is up here ministering, I'm hearing it because I'm, I have my door open and I can hear pretty much everything that goes on. And not to mention I also have cameras. Uh, so just letting you know, <clears throat> since you've already been here a week. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, we, uh, <clears throat> we're working on the sound with the cameras. I don't have sound on them yet, but I will. And, uh, but we have cameras different places around here, actually. But I can generally see the audience here, so I can kind of tell what's going on and <clears throat> tell who's falling asleep. Because sometimes the person preaching doesn't see it, but if you're watching a camera, you can look. Okay, that somebody needs to wake them up. Um, different <laughs> things. So, <clears throat> so if I walk in and walk around behind somebody and kind of nudge them, just that's what I'm doing. I'm just waking them up. So <clears throat> just you know, know that that's going on. So this morning, <clears throat> I should tell you this. <clears throat> uh, Every night, okay, we're not here trying to create polished professional preachers, okay? We are here to help you grow into who Christ has made you, and as part of that, help you learn how to relate that to other people and how to share that, uh, whether it's behind the pulpit, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, it, none of that matters. Now, I uh, also have my phone up here, which I don't normally have it up here, and... Um, you probably hear it going off different times. It may ring. It does often, especially for emergency calls. If it does, we'll have to take a break or move on with it. I'll have to take the call. So, because <clears throat> I am expecting some uh, callbacks today on some situations that have been going on, and I expect them to be good testimonies, uh, but I want to be able to take it. So, also, uh, in every, I, I said the first part about, uh, to, so that you would know that you're not just numbers, you're not just a tuition, uh, that's, that's not who you are, okay? We are here to pour ourselves into you, we're here to give you everything we've got, to help you in any way we can, and so in the evenings, and I know the rest of the staff do the same thing, uh, but in the evenings, especially uh, when I go home, <clears throat> one of the things that I spend my afternoons doing is praying for you, and praying for what God has for you for the next day. In other words, what I'm supposed to say the next day. God, what? Because these are not uh, typical classes yet. And so I pray and say, God, what do you want me to tell them tomorrow? And very honestly, uh, so far, I've never had to ask twice. As soon as I ask, it's right there, and it's just a matter of trying to keep up with what comes. And so uh, each one of these <clears throat> are that, each one of these sessions. That's why sometimes they don't always come out in a polished sermon type, which none of my stuff is hardly ever polished sermon type anyway, but um, they wouldn't either because it's not a matter of a sermon that you need. It's more like chiropractic work. It's a little adjustment here, a little adjustment there. So sometimes it seems like we're kind of all over the place, but it's because you need adjustment. And it's not that any one person needs all the adjustments, it's that each person has a different adjustment, and God is trying to work through all of you to adjust all of you. All right? So, <clears throat> this morning, we are going to look at a couple of things very quickly. I, we, I plan to be done by noon. <clears throat> so, let's go to James first. Not first James. Jane, we're going James first, okay? You say, where's first James? Okay. We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so, James, <clears throat> well, I was there. There we are. James chapter 2. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Paul preached <clears throat> uh, the revelation that God gave him, and it was a revelation of uh, salvation by grace through faith, right? <clears throat> and because he was giving that revelation, it was accurate. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it was accurate. <clears throat> but, well, <clears throat> I shouldn't even say but. I should say and. <clears throat> you can be extremely accurate, and yet 
people take something to an extreme because people don't always hear what you preach. They hear what you preach as, as they apply it to themselves. And sometimes you wouldn't even apply it to them <clears throat> the way they apply it to them, right? Because sometimes you can see the weaknesses whereas they can't. Now, <clears throat> James, what had happened was Paul had preached grace uh, accurately, correctly, and then, <clears throat> but there were people that heard Paul that took it in wrong directions. And James, God inspired, you have to remember this, God inspired James to <clears throat> write his letter not as a <clears throat> rebuttal against Paul, but as a rebuttal against the way people had taken Paul's teachings in a wrong direction. All right? A lot of people have a problem with, <clears throat> with Paul, or I'm sorry, with James, and they try to say, well, he's saying the opposite of Paul. No, no, he's not. Okay? That's the key. That's the first thing you have to get uh, really settled into you. There is not one contradiction in the Bible. Okay? <clears throat> if, the, if there seems to be a contradiction, it's because you're not looking at either piece accurately. When you look at both pieces accurately, or even if you get a really good look at one piece accurately, then usually the other piece will start to fit in. So the key is not just quoting scripture. The key is quoting scripture in context, rightly divided. Now, we are told that the word must be rightly divided, which means that it can be wrongly divided. That's where generally we get denominations and camps and groups and that kind of stuff. Not, you know, there's some good and bad that comes out of those things. But we're going to see here today uh, at least one portion of this, is how James rebutted the error of how Paul was being taught or received. Not a rebuttal to Paul. Okay? So it will fit seamless together. So, now, let's look at this. James chapter 2. We're going to look first. Where do I want to go? Yep, we'll go to verse... Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, we're going to kind of come back and forth, so that'll be all right. Um, <clears throat> look at verse 17. We'll just start there. And like I said, we're going to be going somewhere else and coming back here in a minute, so we'll take it all in context here. Here, James says, Even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Okay? <clears throat> now, there's this thing called epoxy. You know what epoxy is? That's two different elements that by themselves... Uh, do not form anything. But when you put them together, they start to harden. So the two pieces form one different thing, right? So you've got faith, you've got works. If you have only faith, that's one piece of the epoxy. If you have works, that's the other. You can have them separately and still nothing really happened, right? Still, and it wouldn't be right. But when you put those two together, then it creates a third thing, and that third thing is Christianity, right? There's people that... <clears throat> Uh, one of the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes people have is that they think they can fix themselves. Okay, I know I heard that mentioned today too uh, in the early morning. Well, <clears throat> I have a, well, I'll just say a relative. That way it didn't narrow it down too much because I'm an only child so you kind of know where the relative might be <laughs> if I get it too specific. But I had a relative, uh, one time I was talking to this person, it was a male, and I was telling them how they need to get right with God, how Jesus died for them. Uh, I wouldn't be in, you know, hard line, uh, you know, quit your sinning and all that kind of stuff. It was more or less, Jesus loves you. He doesn't want you to live this way. He has a better life for you. You know, it was, I was being really, really easy on them uh, because there was plenty of sin to, to point out, all right? And basically, I just told them, you just need to get right with God. And this person's answer was real simple. Totally wrong, but real simple. But it's the same. It encapsulated an idea that many people have. And this person said to me, well, you know, really, if I just quit drinking and smoking, I'd be right with God. And, I, you know, automatically, you know, most of you, I don't know how much of you, how many of you have been in church very long, but if somebody says that to you, then automatically all kinds of things go off. And you're like, no, you can't make yourself right. You can't do this. You just come to Jesus. You know, that's the standard uh, Christian spiel. And it's true. It's accurate. It's right. Uh, it's not wrong to do that way. 
amazingly, I didn't take that path. Okay, I took a whole other direct. Cause my first thing to him was, you know, the biggest problem you have is not your drinking and smoking. It's your arrogance that you think that's the only imperfections you have. Right? And that didn't go over real good either. But, <laughs> but he did get quiet and he started to listen a little bit. And so I explained to him, I said, you know, the, the thing is not what you're doing. It's the fact that you're not right with God. Because if you were right with God, you naturally would not do these things. You're especially not on an ongoing basis. And so, you know, we talked quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> can't really say, well, there's been some change. So uh, it, there's been some improvement. I, I'm not going to venture a judgment as to the state of his soul at this point. But so the whole point, though, is that most people think that all they have to do to get, to get right with God is stop doing some things. If I just stop doing this, you know, and they see the fruit as the problem rather than the root that causes the fruit. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but I just want to get that across. So first off, he says, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. Now, that's just a blanket statement. Faith by itself is dead if it doesn't have works. Now, works means any energy or activity okay, that you put forth. That, uh, I'm not going to talk about dead works, live works. I'm not, uh, at this point, I might get there in a minute. But I'm, I'm just saying works as a definition. Uh, ergon, it just means energy. right? It just means effort put forth. That's all it means. So it doesn't mean good or bad. Now look at verse 18. Yea, a man may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Right Now, notice what he said. He said, you want to show me your faith without works, which means what? How do you show faith without works? The only thing you can do is say it. Right? Really, that's the only way. You ask us, if you see somebody that's not living, quote unquote, the Christian life, the only way you can know they're Christian is if they tell you. So, and we know that Jesus said there's going to be plenty of people that come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? And, and they're, they're even looking at things they say they did, but they're only saying they did them. I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying the only way that apparently they thought that Jesus would know they did them was if they told him. So when a person has faith but no works, the only way you can know they have faith is if they tell you, right? But James is saying, I don't have to tell you I have faith. You can see my faith by my works. You can see it. Now, you can have works without faith, which isn't good, right? If you have works without faith in Christ, and we're, talking about, we're not talking about faith as a, something you use for something. We're talking about faith in Christ. If you have faith in Christ, let's say you have works, but you don't have faith in Christ. Those works will not get you to heaven, right? And we use that term general, meaning it won't make you right with God. So you have to have faith in Christ, toward Christ, and works that prove that. Now, that, all that is is exactly what John the Baptist told uh, the Pharisees, the scribes, everybody that was coming to him. Uh, he called them brood of vipers. They were coming out to be baptized at uh, River Jordan. And he said, you brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He said, no, you go back. He said, I'm not going to baptize you because if I baptize you, now I am uh, validating that I agree that you're right with God. And he said, I'm not going to do that. Instead, go back and, and, and bring forth fruits of repentance. Right? So what are fruits of repentance? See, repentance, obviously repentance has a fruit and it's not something that is just a, oh, I changed my mind because that would be them coming back and going, okay, we left, we come back, we changed our mind, so we're good. Now we're really repented because we changed our mind. He said, no, bring forth fruits. In other words, let's see it in your life that you have changed. You shouldn't have to tell me you've changed. I ought to be able to see that you've changed. So we can tell you have to have faith, but there has to be, for the faith to not be dead faith, it has to have works that back up what you say you believe, right? Now, let's look, we'll look further. He says, you believe, in verse 19, that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. We talked about this yesterday. <clears throat> now, he says, but will you know, O, o vain man, that faith without works is dead. And then he goes into Abraham and talks about how he was um, 
justified not just by faith, but also by the works that he did. But now look, go back to, uh, let's see. Yeah, go back to verse 14. He says, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have, hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, this is the heart of the question right here. This is why there are entire groups of people that want to take James completely out of the Bible and say, well, we shouldn't, it wouldn't even, shouldn't even be part of the Bible. Well, that's what people always say when they don't have an answer for a doctrine that they don't like. Right? He says in verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. Now notice it doesn't say if a brother or sister uh, not be right with God. It says if they don't have what they need to survive in this life, if they don't have food, if they're destitute. He says, and one of you say unto them, notice saying again, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notice he said, I see that you're, 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 you're uh, you know, you need, you're destitute. You need clothing. You need coats in the winter. And I see that you need food. I see that. So you, I'm blessing you and I'm saying be warmed and be filled. I'm, I'm speaking uh, food into your life and I'm speaking clothing into your life. Uh, now go your way. Right? We know that's not right. He says, notwithstanding, you say these things, but you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does it profit? You say you have faith, but you see your brother in need and you don't do, you hear that? You say you have faith, you say a blessing, but you see a need and you don't do. Do, in, by the very word do, means there is some energy put forth. And energy put forth is what? Works. So you can have dead works. What are dead works? Dead works are any works that you think you can do that's going to give you a better standing with God or make you right with God, right? But living works, okay? True works are works that, that you do. It's energy you put forth because you believe. Now, I'm just going to throw this in, and it's, it's a little parenthetical thing. Listen, you can... I'm just going to be real blunt. You cannot walk in love if you do not walk in power. Right? People say, well, you can't walk in power if you don't walk in love. No, 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 that's not true. But you cannot walk in love unless you walk in power. Why? Because if you don't walk in power, the most you'll ever, you will never be able to walk in agape. All you'll be able to do is walk in sympathy. Why? Because sympathy doesn't help. Sympathy looks on and says, oh, you poor thing. I wish there was something I could do. Agape says, oh, you poor thing. Let me help. You see the difference? Agape, and you want to talk about faith and works? Faith and works, the, the bigger uh, discussion would be love and works. That's bigger than faith and works. Okay? But if you don't walk in the power to cast demons out of a person, you can't help them. So all you're going to be able to do is walk in, you can't even walk in compassion. You sure can't walk in agape. All you can walk in is sympathy because if you don't have the power to cast that devil out, all you're going to be able to do is look at him and say, that's a pitiful case. See, so, you, so to walk in love, to set them free, you have to walk in power and have the power to set them free. Now, there are a lot of people that walk in sympathy and think it's love. <clears throat> and there are people who have gone after love. You know, they, God, I just want to, uh, Joyce Meyer has a, a good book. I'm not putting it down. Okay. I'm not saying anything negative about it. She has a book called uh, Reduce Me to Love. A lot of people have taken that book and said, this is my heart's cry. Reduce me to love. Just let me love. Just give me love. Okay. Love by itself does not set people free. Okay. Okay. John 3.16. What does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world that he thought about helping people. Is that what it says? God so loved the world that he wanted people free. Does it say that? No. It says God so loved the world, what? That he gave. Now, until I exert energy to hand you something, I have not given it. You understand? So for God to walk in love, now he is love, but for love to be expressed, he gave. There was energy 
exerted. Do you get that? So without energy exerted, without work, there is no love. Right? You can say it. Oh, I love you. I love you. Yeah, really? Uh, do you know what that person's going through? Uh, I've heard some things. Okay, have you helped them? No. Then you don't love them. You sympathy them. Love has action. Without action, there is no love. God is love, and what did he do? He gave. Amen? He loved us before we loved him. Isn't that right? So, and if you look, what was the first thing it says God did in Genesis? He, talking about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, he moved upon the face of the deep. What did he do? Did he sit and think about creating a world? No, he moved. Amen? He exerted energy. So the idea that you can have faith or love without walking in power, without moving, without exerting something, without some type of movement toward the thing is totally false. And it is a convenient position for people that want to claim things and not walk in things. Right now, just myself, just, you know, I don't know how much you know about me or whatever else. And, you know, it's really not all important. I can tell you this. I did not get into ministry for a job. Right? Uh, that was not my idea. Um, the whole point is that I found some things. I looked for truth and I found them. And I, did, I there was just automatically in me, I knew I could not keep it to myself. So I had to share it. And as I shared it, God has given us influence. And it has spread throughout the world now. And so, but we've, we have done nothing to make it happen. We've done nothing the way everybody tells us or the way other ministries, we've heard how they work and how they do things. We have done none of that, right? We've done nothing to promote ourselves or to do that kind of, we do, we've not done any of it, right? So all the things they tell you, you got to do, we don't, we haven't done it that way. So bottom line is this, real faith will have works. Okay, it will have. Now, <clears throat> you could also say it another way too, because I jotted it down actually two ways. Number one, real faith has works. Number two, real faith works. Now that means that it will work for you, but it also means that it is working. Real faith is simply knowing God. The more you know it, not know about him. A lot of uh, theologians know about God and do not know him. And if, even if you read the live stories of people like uh, George Mueller, people like that, when he got involved in ministry, he did it because he was moving into a vocation and his father wanted to be set for life. So his father sent him to seminary because that was to get the way to get set for life. Right. And George Mueller was a thief. He was a gambler. He was a womanizer. He was a drunkard. And whenever he went to seminary, he basically wasted all of his dad's money and ended up hanging out instead of going to classes, and he started uh, gambling. And then they went on a holiday, kind of a vacation, he and his buddies that were in seminary. And he, he even with that, he was, a, a, he was able to arrange it so that the trip cost him nothing. In other words, what he did was he was the treasurer and told everybody, okay, the trip's going to cost you this much and this much. And, then, and he added enough in there so he hadn't, didn't have to pay anything. And they basically paid his way, right? And then they went into this place and they all hung out there on this, on this little vacation. And they drank and they womanized and they did all this stuff. And when the money ran out and they couldn't pay their hotel bill, he had to climb out a window and sneak away and actually got caught and put in jail and was there for a bit until his dad got him out, right? And this is the man who learned how to believe God to feed thousands of orphans. So how you start does not matter. I don't care, does not matter. How you end is what matters, okay? Nobody re really remembers that much about George Mueller's early life. What they remember is orphans. He took care of orphans, amen? So. Now, so faith has works. Now, we'll probably talk, well, we will be talking about him during the school also. Now, go with me to, yes, go with me to, uh, we're going to look at a couple places very quickly. 
Well, you know what? We're already in James. Might as well stay there. Go to James chapter 4. We're going to come back there anyway. James 4. Now, notice what James is talking about. James is, is, has been talking about if you say you have faith, you should have works to prove it. He even goes further. Okay? He tells us, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of good stuff in James, uh, to be honest with you. But he finally says uh, in verse, where are we at? 14, yeah. <clears throat> Actually, go to 13. Yeah. Go to now, you that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. In other words, you don't know what's going to happen. But for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So he's saying, okay, don't just automatically say you're going to do this. Say, if the Lord will, we will go into this. But now notice he's, he, he is not saying that in relation to healing or anything included in the atonement. This is about things that are not necessarily directly covered. Okay, You can't look in the Bible and find the, the street address of where you're supposed to live. Right? You'd have to say, well, if the Lord wants us to have that house, he'll open it up. If he doesn't, he'll shut the door. Right? Now, he says in verse 16, but now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Look at verse 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. You got that? If you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin. Right? Now, so in that case, you could have a person that doesn't know anything, and if they don't lay hands on the sick, to them it's not sin. But if you know to lay hands on the sick and you don't do it, to you it would be. Two people, same room, same sick person. Why? Because you know that healing the sick is good. So to do good, to know to do good, and do it that not, it's sin. Now, that is not to get you under condemnation where you feel like you've got to go from person to person and heal every sick person you see all the time. Now, you, should you? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you, didn't, if you weren't caught up in the, today's world of time and all that kind of stuff, you'd probably do it. Right. Now, go with me to, to Matthew. Keep all this in mind, what we've already said. Go with me to Matthew. And we'll try to hurry here. We'll go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 12. Well, you know what? We're going to have to back up anyway. I have the scripture exactly what we want to get to, but to give you the groundwork, you need to see it. So in verse 7, he says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Notice, if you ask, it will be given. If you seek, you will find. Now, always remember, if you seek, you will find. So what you have found is what you were seeking. Remember that. What you have found, okay, let me put it this way. Jehovah Witnesses were looking for a religion based on works that did not include hell. And guess what? They found one, and that's where they stay, until you can convince them otherwise. So what were they seeking? They were seeking a religion, that was based on works, that they could work out their own righteousness, you know, by doing good things, and that would make them right with God, and they didn't want hell. And so they gravitated toward that. It's the same thing with every cult, every group, okay? Now, <clears throat> he says in verse 7, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil. And you say, well, I, I'm not evil. Okay, compared to God, as good as you could be, you're evil. Right? There is that big a gap between your best and if God had a worst, his worst. Okay? So, he says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children... How much more, underline that, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? So what are we talking about? Your Heavenly Father is good, and He's so good, He knows how to give good things to His children that ask Him, right? Now look at the next word in verse 12. 
Therefore, therefore what? Because your heavenly father knows to give good things and knows how to give good things to his children. Because you know that. All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. You hear that? Now, notice he is saying, because you know you have a heavenly father that knows how to take care of you and gives you these good things because of that, then you should do to others what you would want done for you. Now, that goes the full gamut. I can tell you this, these, these two verses, to him that knoweth do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin, and this where he says, do to others as you would have done to you, this is probably two parts, two out of five parts, that is what we have completely based this entire ministry on. Because that's how we get our decisions, it's how we make our decisions, it's how we uh, move forward. And it's very simple because all of my staff knows if somebody comes to the bookstore and they're looking at two things and they're like, boy, I want both of these. But, and, and they see them looking at both and they're like, and, and it's two different things, you know, not the same topic maybe or something, but two different uh, items that they're looking at. And they put one back. Maybe they put the most expensive back and they get the cheaper one. Whenever they come up to the counter, my staff knows they have the authority to give them the other thing automatically. Why? Because we don't, we, what would I want done for me? That's how we live. That's how we do our bookstore. It's how we do our ministry. It's how we do everything. It's how we heal the sick. If somebody is sick and I see them out there and I look at them and I think, if that was me and somebody like me that had the power of God in their life was walking by, would I want them to come to me and set me free? Yes. Then I have a responsibility to go do it to them. See, people look at that as in terms of just being nice. You know, open the door, how, you know, how you treat people. Jesus never just talked about being nice. He always dealt with, and you have to understand, if he's talking, he's talking with the idea that God's power was at his disposal. He was not thinking like a normal human being. He was thinking like a son of God, which is what you are. Amen? Now, he says, <clears throat> uh, let's see, yeah. <clears throat> Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What does that mean? <coughs> what, did it, what did Jesus, it, let me give you another example. Remember what Jesus said when they said, uh, good master, what is the greatest commandment? What did he say? You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and your strength. And then he said, Remember, he added one that the young man didn't ask him about. He said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, what's, he didn't say what's the top two. He said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Oh, wait, wait, don't walk off. Uh, the second is like the first, which is what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. How do you do that? You do to others what you would want done for you. Right. So now notice what he's saying. If you're going to love God, if you're going to love your neighbor, now get this. Okay, drill this in. Okay, focus in. If you're going to love God, if you're going to love your neighbor, then you are going to do. What is do? Energy exerted. You get that? It's a work. Now, is it a work to be right with God? No, it's a work out of gratitude because you're right with him and because you love him, you're going to do something. Love moves. You got that? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Strength. Strength is part of the body. Love Him with your body. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, Romans 12, 3 says, but you also present your bodies and you love Him with all your strength by actually doing what you know to do because then what you know to do, that you do, it's not sin if you do it. It's only sin if you don't. That makes sense, or did I totally confuse you there? Okay. Now, he says, watch this. <clears throat> and he, he actually told me, he said, this is the law and the prophets, right? What did he say the law and the prophets was summed up in? That you love God, you love your neighbor? The law of love is what? That's, that sums up the law, the law and the prophets, right? And here he said, to do sums up the law and the prophets. So you cannot separate the two. You cannot separate faith from works. Works comes out of your faith. If you have faith, you will have works. Now, you can have works 
and not have faith. Right? You can. It's not good. Not the way to go. But you cannot have faith without works. You, it is impossible, right? It, it's like saying, well, you know, uh, he's alive, but he's not breathing. It's, that's impossible, right? If you're alive, you're going to be breathing. Why? Because the, breathe, the, the being alive is the result of breathing, right? You could even say it either way, you know. But so here he says, now watch the next part. Verse 13. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Hear that? A lot of people go in the gate of destruction. Okay? And then verse 14, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. The way that leads to life is, is narrow, and few find it. People say, what? Well, but there's millions all over the world. Yeah, okay, compare that to seven billion people. That's a few, right? You can, well, don't have time to get into it today, but we'll talk some about the um, percentages of who got saved during Noah's time compared to the number of people that was living at the time, okay? It's a few. So, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. He says, you shall know them by their fruit. What does that say? What does that mean? He, he's saying, they're going to come to you. They're, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be saying stuff. He said, you're not going to know them by what they say. You're going to know them by what they produce. You're going to know them by what their works are. All right? So <clears throat> he said, your works will line up with what you believe. That's why he said you can look at their works. Jesus even said, you don't believe me for my words, believe me for the works sake. Why? Because my works line up with my words. When a person's words don't line up with their works, that person is false on the inside. Okay? Now, uh, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot more we can go into there. Uh, that's where he said in verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and read that. Verse 21. Not everyone, in verse 20, he just told, well, you know what, mothers keep on reading, whatever. Let's go back. <laughs> okay. He says in verse 16, you should know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. This is in red. Jesus said it. You can't get around it. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. See, that's where people get into this thing about, well, you know, inside. You know, you don't know my heart. No, I don't have to know your heart. I can see your heart. I see your heart by what you do. It's real simple. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down, chopped down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, listen carefully, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. You get that? Not he that would really like to do the will. Not he that thinks about doing the will. But he that does the will. That's what Jesus said. I came to do not mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Isn't that right? And that's what he did. And he said, I must finish the work that he gave me. And we are to be just like him. So we got to get this thing out of our, our heads uh, that somehow, you know, works is a bad thing. Right? It's only bad if you try to use it to get somewhere with God. But our lives, I don't know where you came from, but my life, I determined to live as a gratitude for what God had done with me, not in where he brought me in this life, but the fact of what he brought me from before I knew him, before I walked with him, right? So now, very quickly, let's go. We're going to go. Yep, we'll go to one more. Uh, go to Luke 15. So is it, Ned, you get anything out of this so far? Right? Are you getting it? Okay. Because uh, we're, we're shifting gears a little bit here. Go to Luke 15. 
And I'm again, I'm going to try to hurry here because I don't want to take too long. I start about, <clears throat> let's see, let's, let's start at verse 11. Jesus is speaking and he's given a parable. And he says, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now, went for a for a Jewish person to hear this, that's like the lowest of the low because they weren't even supposed to be around pigs, right? So this is like, this is the worst job that he could have. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk from the corn that the pigs did eat. And no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, in other words, he woke up one day and go, what am I doing here? When he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And here I am, I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Notice he had compassion and what happened? He ran toward him. His compassion had feet. You got that? His compassion moved. He did something. And he said, <clears throat> uh, there you go. <clears throat> Where'd I go? Yeah, there you go. I almost lost it. And, his, and he had, and he, notice he said, he had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. So what did he do? He truly repented, turned around and went and did exactly what he said he was going to do. Right. That's the fruit of true repentance. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat. And be merry for this is my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found and they began to be merry. Now his elder son, notice elder. His elder son was in the field doing what he's supposed to be doing, working. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother is come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not even go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, lo, these many years do I serve you. Neither transgressed I at any time your commandment. And yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this, thy son, and notice what he said, he didn't even say my brother. He said this, your son. See, whenever somebody starts saying your son, okay, I don't know, if you're married, okay, and you, and you got kids, and your spouse says, do you know what your son did today? Okay, that kid is in trouble. Amen? Okay, just saying. He said, now, watch this. <clears throat> and he said, but as soon as this, your son was come, which has devoured your living with harlots, and is, he said, you have killed for him the fatted calf. Notice, he didn't just say, yeah, you know, my brother went off and did some bad things. He detailed them. You notice that? Detailed it. And he said unto him, son, you are ever with me. And all that I have is yours. In other words, you could have went and killed the fatted calf anytime you want. You, it's all yours, right? And yet the son, the elder son, didn't think that way. And he said, it was right that we should make merry and be glad for this, your brother, 
See what's he doing? He emphasized your son, but now the father's saying your brother. He didn't say this, my son is back. He said, your brother. What's he doing? He's pointing back to this man saying, what is wrong with you? Your brother's back. You should be glad. Your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Now, <clears throat> tie that. And again, I don't have much time, so go with me to 1 Samuel. I know this sounds like we're jumping around here a lot, but 1 Samuel. And we're going to go to chapter 16. And then we're going to show you the, the overall main point here that I'm trying to get across to you today. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. You notice Saul was still alive, but Samuel was mourning over him because God had rejected him and said, I'm not going to have him be king anymore. I'm going to pick somebody else. And Samuel was mourning over Saul, but yet Samuel still obeyed God and he took his horn of oil and he went to find him. He said, and Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. He's mourning over the fact, but yet he's saying, I can't, God, I can't do what you're asking me to do because if Saul finds out, he's going to kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. It would, he wasn't telling a lie. He really was because they had to sacrifice to anoint the next king. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And you shall anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spoke, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Now notice this. It's amazing. They tremble at his coming. The prophet shows up, and the first thing they say is, Do you come peaceably? Think about that. Yeah. He said, Now are you coming here to bless us? Or did we do something wrong and you're fixing to put a curse on us and we're going to have famine and our flocks are going to die and herds are going to die? What, what, why are you here? Because the prophets had the reputation of if they show up, it's either going to be really good or really bad, right? Because there was just, they had, well, we have the same thing today. And he said peaceably, he, he answered to them peaceably. I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourself, separate yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And when it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, which was the elder son, the elder, okay, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as men seeth, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Now, imagine you're standing there before him, you're the elder brother, you're the one that's supposed to fall to. The prophet comes up and says, we're going to anoint a new king today. And the seven sons of, of seven out of eight of Jesse's sons are there. And they all line up and everybody's in their finest because the prophet has come. And they're all lined up in front of him and they're thinking, okay, boys, which one is it going to be? Well, Eliab would have automatically thought, it's going to be me, I'm the elder. It makes sense. You know, I'm tall, apparently good looking. Everything's, I got it together. This is it. This is it, boys. This is what I've been waiting for. And then God says, this ain't him. I have, notice what he says, literally, okay? He says, because I have refused him. I have refused him. Now imagine that. Imagine the Samuel, because Samuel doesn't know who it is yet. He walks up with his horn of oil, and he's ready to anoint him as king. He looks at him and goes, now the Lord's refused you. How do you think it made Eliab feel? You know, isn't it funny? He wasn't too concerned about his feelings. He didn't say, well, you know, we're just going to wait here a bit and see. Because, you know, I just don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. So, um, you know, but, but if it's not you, you know, then, then know that the Lord has good things for you. you know? No, he didn't do that at all. He, goes, he walks up and says, yeah, the Lord's refused you. He goes to the next one. And he goes down the whole list. Goes to the, all, every one of them gives their names. Okay? And I love the names of these guys. I mean, because you, it's funny when you look them up. All right? The next one here is, um, what's the name? Uh, Abinadab? Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Abinadab. Ab 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 Abinadab, actually, is more the way it's supposed to be pronounced. And then the last one, and when I first started reading this, I'm like, I'm just going to call him Shamu. You know, here's Shamu, <laughs> okay? But, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this. And he went by all seven, and the Lord has not chosen these. So he stands back and goes, no, nope, it's none of you. He said, but I know God sent me here, told me to call you, so do, is this all your, all your sons? And what did Jesse say? Well, well, no. Well, wait a minute. Didn't he say, call all your sons together? And yet they didn't even call David. And Jesse said, well, I, I've got another son, but he's just a lad, and he's out there, and he's taking care of some sheep. And, and you know, he's out there, and so, you know, we didn't even call him in. They didn't even consider him in the running. And yet that was the one God chose. Amen. And there was a song years ago, and you should always, if you, you were to look it up, find it. It probably sounds out of date now, but it's, the message is awesome. And it's very simply this. When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. You need to remember that. Don't worry about what other people think about you because they may be seeing the shepherd boy, but God sees a king in you. So don't worry about what other people think. Only concern yourself with what God thinks about you. And that doesn't mean don't take counsel. It doesn't mean be arrogant about it. It's just saying don't let other people put you down until you'll never amount to anything. You amount to Jesus because that's what you're called to. All right? Then he says, and you go, he goes through the whole thing. Now I'm trying to move forward because if you go into verse uh, chapter 17 and even in verse uh, chapter 18, we're not going to go there right now. I'm just going to tell you the story, but you should read it. Uh, there come a point where we all know the story because in chapter 17, uh, David goes out and, and actually what happens is all of the, the, the elder sons, all of these older brothers of David, they all go to the battle, to the war between the Israelites and the Philistines. And they go out there and now they've been out there for like 40 days and, they, and the battle is at a stalemate and they got their lines drawn. And it's funny because all the Israelites are hiding behind these, uh, their, line, their battle lines. And every day, about the same time, this giant Goliath comes out who had five brothers. And he comes out and mocks Israel. And then finally, and, and all, the, all of David's brothers are there. They're all in the army. They're not fighting. They're not winning. They're not being good soldiers. They're hiding behind whatever they're using as defenses. And then Jesse, David didn't even get to go to the battle. He had to stay home and watch the sheep. And Jesse one day says, listen, take some cheese, take some milk, take some food, some bread and stuff. Take it all over to your brothers and let's see how they're doing. I want to, and when you come back, come back. He said, bring me a pledge back. That means come back and let me know how they're doing. I want to make sure all my sons are still alive. Well, they're, they're alive. They're all hiding. And he said, you go do this. So Je uh, David gets in the cart and has a servant there with the cart. They get there. He leaves the cart with the servant. He gets out and he says, what's going on? And it was about the same time that the Goliath came out every day and starts mocking Israel. And David's hearing that. And he says, well, what's, what, what's going to happen to the guy that kills this thing? He's not even thinking in terms of, wow, we, it's a good thing we're hiding back here. He said, what's going to happen to the guy that kills this thing? And notice the first people, other people told him. Well, uh, the king's going to set his family free. He's going to get to marry the king's daughter. He's going to, and he goes through this whole list of things. Uh, everybody, when he, it's a young boy, young. He was probably between the ages of uh, 15 and 17. And he said, here's this young boy. And they answer him and tell him what's going to happen. They don't say, well, it's none of your business because you can't do anything about it. They didn't say that. Other people answered him and said, this is what's going to happen. But it, and whenever... His brothers heard the other people telling David what's going to happen. His brothers come up to him. His elder brother comes up and says, what are you doing here? I know the naughtiness of your heart. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to go out and see a battle. You, just want to, you, you know, you're just a young kid. Why don't you back home keeping those few sheep? Even his own brothers were talking about how small the flock was that he was watching. In other words, you're not doing anything important. What are you doing here? Why are you coming out here? And then... They rehearsed it again. He said, well, I'm just trying to find out what's going to happen to the guy that kills this Goliath that's bringing a reproach on Israel. And so they tell him again, this is what's going to happen. You're going to, your family's going to be free and, and you're going to get to marry the king's daughter. And David says, wait, 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 wait. King's daughter, what does she look like? Because it might be worth it. Right? And so and the king's got a couple of daughters. Right? And you find out later he was promised one. He didn't even get that one. 
And then, the, then King Saul actually gave him another daughter for the purpose he knew that she would set a snare for him. Imagine that. Uh, Saul tried to kill David something like 12 or 15 times. Different times tried to kill him. You would think after the third or fourth time it ain't working, you might want to give up, right? But the amazing thing about this is this. It was always the elder brothers that did not encourage. <coughs> the elder brothers were always one saying, oh, you just want to be somebody. Oh, you just want to step up. You just want to be seen. I know why you're here. So remember, don't be surprised when your elder brothers and sisters in the church tell you the same thing. Who do you think you are? What makes you think you can do this? You ain't no Benny Hinn. You ain't no John Lake. You ain't no... It's, 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 don't, don't be surprised when they say that stuff and tell them, no, you're exactly right. I'm an original. God made me an original. And I'm, if I am a copy, I'm a copy of Jesus Christ. So I'm not Benny Hinn. I'm not John Lake. I'm not Smith Wigglesworth. They're gone. Benny Hinn didn't. Okay. <laughs> Let me retract that. Okay. But this is our time. Amen. This is your time. God knew when to get you here. This is your time. Now, the key about this is very simple. The one thing you want to remember is this. How long... Okay, Samuel went to, to anoint David as king, and yet they had a king. David didn't say, all right, this is a great deal. I'm anointed king. I'm king. I, I'm just going to march into the palace and tell Saul, yeah, it's time for you to leave. Right? He didn't do that. He didn't do anything bad. He went in and actually tried to do things right. The one thing that stands out about David, remember David, God said that David was a man after his own heart and how David did things. It said he conducted himself wisely in all these things. Even after he killed Goliath, he conducted himself wisely. He didn't get haughty over it or anything else. He didn't go to Saul and say, yeah, yeah let's see, what, who, what giant have you killed? He didn't say it at all. He served even though he knew he was the rightful king of Israel. From the moment he was anointed, he knew that you're sitting in my seat. That's my chair you're in. But he didn't say that. He didn't act that way. What did he do? He served. He did everything he could. And all it did was make Saul matter and matter and matter. And he kept getting matter because when you do right, when somebody knows they're doing wrong and you keep doing right toward them, it infuriates them. Right? And so... But the beauty of it is this, and this is the one thing, well, one of many things, that David understood that the church today needs to get a hold of. David understood the difference between positional and experiential. David knew from the minute Samuel anointed him with oil, he was king. Was he in the palace? Nope. But he knew he was king. And yet he treated the current king with respect and honor. He had so many opportunities to kill Saul, and he didn't. As a matter of fact, he even had people put to death that treated Saul wrong. Think about that. And so he treated Saul right. He, he acted with honor. And why? Because he said, yeah, positionally, I'm king. And someday, experientially, I will experience it. And, but he kept doing good until then. See, the church today doesn't understand that. They say, positionally, uh, you know, I, I'm uh, what I am uh, inside what God made me, that's what I am and that's the way it is and there's no other. no. There is a position where God has put you through Jesus Christ, but there is also the experiential because spiritually you are right with God. Spiritually you are walking with him. You're recreating Christ's image, but, but uh, that's positional. But experientially, your soul has to start to line up. Your body has to line up, right? So there is a positional and there is experiential. The, the, the Christian walk is getting the experiential to line up with the positional. That's called growing up into Christ. There is a growth process that takes place. And that growing up, because you were made, that's why when you die, if you died right now, you'd go be with him. Why? Because you're right with him. But your head may be messed up. Your body may be messed up. Right? <clears throat> and so God is working all of that to bring it all together. And so we have to realize, like David, yes, I am right with God. Yes, I'm a king and a priest right now. And yes, I will walk this way. I and mean, if you mess up, you get back up and you go, thank God there's a difference between positional and experiential because if the positional was experiential based on your actions, then the experiential would prove that your positional is you're not right with God. But the fact is, positional, you're right with God. And now growth helps you line up so that you experience rightness with God. Amen? That's the key. 
And that's the main point I want to get across today. But if you just sit and do nothing, you're not right with God. Right? If you're right with God, if you have faith towards God, you cannot help but have movement toward him. Amen? So, yes, I think that's it today. Yep, that's where we'll stop because I've already went way over what I meant to. So we will stop now. Uh, did you get anything out of this? Yes. All right. Uh, these, these little classes we're doing during the day, uh, we're, next week we're going to start into the actual courses, but all of these are adjustments. They're actually helping you head that direction so that you know where we're going uh, because this is a school of the new creation. It is a school that's going to teach you how to walk in who you are and we're going to get the experiential to line up with the positional. Amen? That's our point. That's our purpose. So uh, I want to get that point across today. So other than that, I guess we're good.